When it comes to the people we cherish the most, many, if not all of us, are willing to go above and beyond to help our loved ones in their times of need. Whether that person is a child, a parent, a spouse, or even a total stranger, we as a social species are capable of wonderful things if it means those relationships will live on for another day. James Sunderland was a man we all thought embodied that feeling of going above and beyond for a person that he loves as he traveled the Silent Hill in search of his wife, Mary. While we all know how things turned out in the end for not only James, but the people he met along the way, let me rewind the story to the very beginning and break down some of the key moments of James in Silent Hill 2 in my regular analysis fashion. Before we dive into those scenes, however, often the appearance of a person can indicate their possible demeanor or personality. That is not to say that your looks define who you are as a person, it is more so a visual cue to those around you of your general well-being or image that you want to outwardly express. The first thing that draws your attention to James is not his handsome face, but his signature green jacket. This green jacket is based off a M65 field jacket with a dropped collar. This is a classic military field coat that allows a soldier to carry ammunition and gear when needed. It is also wind and water resistant to help protect one from the elements. While one would assume possibly that his father Frank Sunderland served in the military, the real reason James wears his jacket is to pay homage to Jacob's Ladder in which the main character Jacob wears a jacket of similar nature. Outside of that, there is nothing else that makes James stand out visually as his jacket does more than enough to define who he is once a player has made it through the game. Regarding James's background before the events of Silent Hill, it is stated in the Silent Hill 2 novelization that James was quite a good runner back in his school days. After graduating high school, he eventually had found work as a clerk for a small company with speculations of it being in Ashfield. It is speculated it is Ashfield because we know that his father, Frank Sunderland, is a superintendent of the very infamous apartment in that very city. James ends up meeting Mary at a house party due to them both sharing a mutual friend and well things were happily ever after. You know, until someone got tired of it all, but moving on. With the appearance and some background of James out of the way, let us now look at some of the key scenes of Silent Hill 2. In this first scene, we meet Angela Orozco, which I have done an analysis on already if you were curious. But this scene holds a lot of significance to who James is, as this is our first time seeing him interact with another person. This, uh, th this town, there's something wrong with it. It's kind of hard to explain, but... Is it dangerous? Maybe. And it's not just the fog, either. Okay, it's... I got it. I'll be careful. I'm not lying. No, I believe you. It's just... I guess I really don't care if it's dangerous or not. I'm going to town either way. But why? I'm looking for... someone. Notice how apprehensive James sounds in this conversation. Angela is not the greatest communicator, but James here sounds even more disconnected than she does. Who, who, who is it? Someone very important to me. I'd do anything if I could be with her again. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. Do what? I didn't do anything. I, I swear. He was like this when I got here. My, uh, my name's James. James Sunderland. Um, Eddie. Eddie. Who's that dead guy in the kitchen? I didn't do it. I swear I didn't kill anybody. You're not friends with that red pyramid. <laughs> Red pyramid thing. I don't know what you're talking about. Honest. But I did see some weird looking monsters. They scared the hell out of me, so I 
ran in here. Well, I guess this place isn't too safe either. What happened here anyway? Uh, I, I told you, I don't know. I'm not even from this town. I just, I just... In the same fashion, James's interaction with Eddie is a bit bizarre as well. While he sounds more confident in his questions here, his demeanor is uncanny. With the events that have taken place thus far, he shows no real acknowledgement to his environment. I do not know about you, but I do not think I could introduce myself to another person with a dead body just casually sitting in the next room. At least Eddie here has a physical response. <sighs> You too, huh? Something just brought you here, right? Uh, yeah, you could say that. Well, whatever it is, I think you better get out of here soon. Yeah, you're right. What about you? I'll leave as soon as I'm done here. Eddie, be careful. In this next scene, we get more of an interaction with Angela, who we see struggling mentally, yet at times, she seems to know more than she is aware of. But, you're the same as me. It's easier just to run. Besides, is what we deserve. No, I'm not like you. Notice the line in which she says her and James are the same, and how the camera shows us both of them in the mirror. James of course denies this claim, which at this specific angle is him denying the man that he sees before him. The man. That is him. Are you afraid? I... I'm sorry. So, why did you come to this town anyway? I'm sorry. Did did you find the person you're looking for? Not yet. Her name's Mary. She's my wife. I, I'm sorry. It's okay. Anyway, she's dead. I don't know why I think she's here. Take note of that line right there. James literally states his wife is dead with little emotion. This is alarming in many ways as it appears he is at times connected with reality, but also at times not. In other words, psychosis. She's dead? Don't worry. I'm not crazy. At least, I don't think so. Mary? No, you're not. Do I look like your girlfriend? No, my late wife. I can't believe it. You could be her twin. Your face, your voice, just your hair and clothes are different. Her name is Maria. I don't look like a uh, ghost, do I? As stated before, James' psychosis is much like the fog surrounding him and Maria in this scene. Notice how eager and excited he was when he thought Maria was Mary. This is the most emotion we have seen from him in the entire game up to this point, indicating he is falling deeper into his own delusions. See? Feel how warm I am? You're really not Mary. I told you. I'm Maria. Sorry. I was confused. Where are you going? I'm looking for Mary. Have you seen her? Didn't you say she died? Oh yeah, three years ago. James's reaction and line here further support that he is not of sound mind. Your wife is dead? And you know she is dead, yet you are still looking for her, somehow believing she is still alive? But I got a letter from her. 
She says she was waiting in our special place. And that's here? Anyway, I haven't seen her. After finally chasing down Laura for more information on Mary, take note of how James acts here when he's confronted with reality. Keep feeding yourself those lies, James. Laura? Huh? You know my name? Eddie told me. That big fat blabbermouth. How do you know about Mary? What's the big deal? Why can't you just tell me? You gonna yell at me if I don't? No, I won't. You're alive! Maria, I thought that thing killed you. Are you hurt bad? Not at all, silly. Maria? That thing, it stabbed you. There was blood everywhere. Stabbed me? What do you mean? It chased us to the elevator, and, James, and then... James, what are you talking about? Just before! Don't you remember? James, honey, did something happen to you? After we got separated in that long hallway? Are you confusing me with someone else? <laughs> you were always so forgetful. Remember that time in the hotel? Maria? You said you took everything, but you forgot that videotape we made. I wonder if it's still there. How do you know about that? Aren't you Maria? I'm not your Mary. So, you're Maria? I am, if you want me to be. All I want from you is an answer. It doesn't matter who I am. I'm here for you, James. See? I'm real. So, I must apologize for breaking the immersion here, but this scene in particular serves as one of the most damning pieces of evidence of James's psychosis. Maria did in fact die a moment ago, Yet by her simply denying the answer he seeks, we see James willingly go along with whatever she says. Don't you want to touch me? I... don't know. Come and get me. I can't do anything through these bars. Now his last line does make this thought confusing though, as he states, I don't know, in a much duller manner than his previous lines. Either James at this point has hopefully started to realize the truth he needs to acknowledge within him, or he is so far gone in his own world that there is no coming back. Okay. Stay right there. I'll be there soon. Losing the people around you are a part of life, and in this scenario, not only did James kill Eddie out of self-protection, but moments ago, after meeting up with Maria once more, he is reminded that death is a reoccurring theme in his visit to Silent Hill. Maria has died multiple times in front of James, but it does not seem to connect in his mind until it is he who is behind the trigger. Up until now, he could chalk up the loss of Maria to a third party, but in Eddie's case, it was his hands and his hands alone that took another person's life. Eddie? Eddie? I... 
I killed a... a human being. A human being. It is here where we see his psychosis slowly start to dissipate. As the web of lies he believed begins to unravel, we see here he questions his own beliefs. This form of cognitive thought is a fracture in his armor, and little does he know, that fracture is about to get much bigger. Did you really die three years ago? At the Lakeview Hotel, with the assistance of Laura to string him along, James finally makes it to room 312. Here, he is confronted with his actions and the truth he was so desperately trying to hide from. Did I scare you? Yeah, you did. You're here to find Mary, aren't you, James? Well, have you? No. Is that why you're here, too? She's here, isn't she? If you know where she is, tell me. I'm tired of walking. I wish I knew. But she said it in her letter. What letter? Wanna read it? But don't tell Rachel, okay? Who's Rachel? She was our nurse. I took it from her locker. Laura, how old are you? Um... I turned eight last week. So, Mary couldn't have died three years ago. Could, could she really be here? Is this the quiet, beautiful place she was talking about? Are you taping again? Come on. <sighs> I don't know why, but I just love it here. It's so peaceful. You know what I heard? This whole area used to be a sacred place. I think I can see why. <sighs> it's too bad we have to leave. Please promise you'll take me again, James. <laughs> After witnessing what he has done with his own hands, James is forced to make one of two decisions. To either feign deeper into his psychosis or break free from it in its entirety. It appears this time, for once in a long time, he chooses the latter option. Arguably, I feel as though this is the first time we get to experience the real James. A man filled with conflicted emotions of selfishness and grief. Even though James is now aware of his actions, those very actions bring consequences. Once again, he must suffer through the loss of Maria. What makes this time different though, is he is no longer disconnected from reality. He has accepted the things he has done and why he deserves his punishment. I was weak. That's why I needed you. I needed someone to punish me for my sins. 
that's all over now. I know the truth. Now it's time to end this. As we, the player, make our way down the hallway, we get snippets of James and Mary's relationship, the ups and downs of it all. In one way, it is reasonable to perhaps side with James or feel sympathy for him at this point. Dealing with an illness, mentally or physically, does not excuse a person's actions. When you are going to die and there's nothing anyone can do about it, it is not unreasonable to act the way that Mary did. It is a last ditch effort to lessen the blow of her death to those she loved by pushing them away. She did not want to die or see James go. She just wanted her life back. Mary? What do you want, James? I, uh, I brought you some flowers. Flowers? I don't want any damn flowers. Just go home already. Mary, what are you saying? Look, I'm disgusting. I don't deserve flowers. Between the disease and the drugs, I look like a monster. Well, what are you looking at? Get the hell out of here! Leave me alone already! No use to anyone. I'll be dead soon anyway. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. It'd be easier if they'd just kill me. But I guess the hospital's making a nice profit off me. They want to keep me alive. Are you still here? I told you to go! Are you deaf? Don't come back! James! With the death of Maria, in other words, James's manifestation of his own selfish desires for the final time, we are given a moment in time in which we see Mary and James interact. It is safe to say that this should be treated as a convergence of James' psyche. Meaning, based on the player's actions throughout the game, this very scene, much like James' state of mind, will change. But for this analysis, I bring focus on the in-water ending, as I feel it fits the story and James the most. Mary? James. Forgive me. I told you that I wanted to die, James. I wanted the pain to end. That's why I did it, honey. I just couldn't watch you suffer. <coughs> no. That's not the whole truth. You also said that you didn't want to die. The truth is, part of me hated you for taking away my life. You killed me, and you're suffering for it. It's enough, James. James's journey through Silent Hill, for most of it, was in a state of psychosis, a condition causing him to lose his touch with reality due to the trauma he could not accept. His constant interactions with Angela, Eddie, Laura, and Maria all were Silent Hill's way of trying to remind him of who he really was. Yet time and time again he ignored every warning sign by obsessing over a reality he knew no longer existed. It was not until the very end that the fog over his mind lifted so he could see exactly what he is. He is not a knight in shining armor that is on a mission to save his wife. He is a coward and a selfish individual who thought the world owed him something. It is the sense of sympathy that we want to develop for him because in some ways we understand the emotions that he felt. But the in-water ending, I feel, completes this analysis the most by showing these very characteristics. James wanted control of his life and would do anything to maintain it. Perhaps deep down in his conscience, he felt some sort of guilt for what he did, which brought him here. 
But ultimately, like with Mary, when James realized at the end of Silent Hill 2 that he could no longer remain control of his life going forward, well, he decided how he would end it. Now I understand the real reason I came to this town. I wonder, what was I afraid of? Without you, Mary, I've got nothing. Now we can be together. <laughs>